Zaharoff was one of my role models, one of my idols when I was young, because he had a lifestyle, as did uh, Gabriel Denunzio, of uh, rather bizarre proportions. And uh, his uh, home, uh, Chateau uh, Ballincourt, in the south of France, had a black draped satanic chamber in it. And uh, he had a blue grotto in his cellar that was an actual uh, lake that had a little trysting place on one of the shores. And uh, his launch or gondola that he would bring his latest fling that he'd picked up in a pastry shop or wherever too. And uh, it was really, uh, the kind of lifestyle that I thought was colorful and befitting someone who was a, a misfit, an outcast, who had great pride in their alienation. And uh, he was never really deciphered, even beyond his death, much like B. Traven. He remained a mystery. To this day, he remains somewhat of a mystery. and. Uh, Denunzio was another one of those guys that was so instrumental in the affairs of, of the world up to and including the Second World War. He uh, died in 1938, but uh, he was a formidable writer, and military man, strategist, and had his own on the island of Ome had his own military force, established his own government. He was Dalmatian, and uh, he lived aboard a ship that was actually his home that was built like a ship. He watched movies, he loved movies. He had this private projection sessions or screening sessions, and uh, generally an interesting character. Probably the mystery men of the world have always fascinated me because there was something about them they didn't want known and enough about them that they did want known that couldn't be hidden no matter how hard they tried because their penchants for the bizarre completely overruled their needs for privacy. And uh, I guess I see enough of that in myself where I sort of lead with my chin and have made a lifestyle that is certainly uh, of interest to somebody out there, but at the same time being extremely private, extremely reclusive in many other ways where I don't want people, I don't need people, I don't really like people, and yet I, I recognize that people basically are interested in many of the same things that I am and many of the things that I do. So I can't really say that without being a hypocrite, say that I don't like people, because if there were no people that liked or were interested in what I'm doing, there should be no point in my doing it. People react to me in uh, extremes. They either are all for what I'm doing based on what they know, or based on what they don't know, they're very much against what I'm doing. I think we've given the uh, religious community a great deal of sustenance, a great deal of substance, and perpetuated far more than we've destroyed, at least in what they call their end times. Explicitly, the Church of Satan has been a shot in the arm. It's been a sort of rejuvenation for many of them, because in their apocalyptic days, they can turn in a tangible way to the Church of Satan and say, see, see, see there? It does exist. There really is something we have to worry about. And they always are quick to disclaim any kind of, uh, of uh, slanderous commentary that might lead to litigation. However, they know full well that just by dropping the name of reality, it can perhaps bolster their, their waning uh, enterprise. Television is actually much closer to the new religion, universal religion, than Christianity is. If the 
gods or the priests, the high priests of television, want to overnight, and it serves their purposes, they can or could eliminate Christianity as we know it. And uh, the influence of television is certainly far, far greater than the influence of traditional Christianity. Actually, Christians are the only, the only people that embrace the notion of an anthropomorphic Satan or a Satan that is a real being that infiltrates their lives, tempts them to do things, and can be used as a scapegoat or be blamed for whatever goes wrong in their lives. We believe in taking responsibility for our own actions and uh, not saying, of course, as a Christian would, that the devil made me do it. And if we do something, we have to answer for it. If it's some antisocial act, we have to weigh the decision to do it, whether or not if we get caught, if we get punished, it's really worth it. And we don't depend so much upon conscience as we do upon pragmatism. So Satanism and Satanic priests or clergy are not intended to save anyone. They're not intended to be a police force. Police departments should be able to do that, prohibit or restrict or enforce or mete out justice, not priests. Satanists are everywhere, even in bowling alleys. So that's where you'll find us. We're all congregating here in the bowling alleys, working on our score. A satanic world is a world reborn in purity, a world where uh, the instinct and the intellect will be complementary to one another rather than uh, being at odds with one another. It will be a world in which uh, we follow laws of nature instead of just the rules that man's made up to regulate his conduct. It will be a world in which uh, masters will be masters and slaves will be slaves and never the tween shall meet. Le Bezal has struck me as an ecologist in the same way that someone like Tiny Tim is an ecologist and that he's preserving important things from a world that is dying and carrying them through this world that is dead, um, preserving them for a world that is yet to come. The Church of Satan has declared total war on ignorance. Uh, this has often been misconstrued by mainstream media. It's not a uh, war of race. It is a war of the intelligent versus the stupid, of predator and prey, master and slave, domination and servitude. Um, Satan represents the powers of force in nature and we feel that a cleansing of the idiot ideology of the pallid incompetent Christ is uh, in order and so uh, this is something that the Church of Satan is conducting on many different avenues. We're doing this through the use of uh, uh, what we have called aesthetic terrorism. Uh, this involves the creative use of art, uh, music, writing, uh, effectively what we call propaganda, the dissemination of information to uh, influence uh, what we call iron youth. Ever since I was very young, we were like the Adams family, but we were the real thing. We were like a Charles Adams cartoon. We really were. Uh, but I didn't know that as a child. I don't think, I don't know if anyone ever really thought about it that way. But in retrospect, I, I look at Charles Adams' books and I say, hey, this is just like what we were like. We had all the same animals. We, we looked very similar to that, actually. The, we, we sort of dressed the same. And, and I don't think it was an affectation, really. I think it just happened to be that way because it was just my father's natural inclination towards liking things that were sort of darkly mysterious and things that were unique and different, unusual. We had very unusual pets for that period of time. We had a crocodile. We had a black leopard. I grew up with a black leopard. We had a tarantula, and the tarantula would walk down the front hall. <laughs> and one year, my father drew a greeting card for the solstice. We celebrate the winter solstice. And on it, he had a drawing of himself and my mother and our pets. And one of them was the tarantula and one of us had the tarantula on a leash. While I was in high school, they had a book fair. And uh, I went to this book fair, 
with about five or six dollars on me looking for a book. And lo and behold, they were selling a copy of the Satanic Bible. And this is the very first uh, contact I had with uh, Anton LaVey. And I really enjoyed his book. And one thing that uh, I got from his philosophy was that it provided a, a healthy way for an individual to deal with and channel his hatred. And uh, since I read this text, uh, I have a very, very uh, fun way to deal with all of these people that irk me. And uh, what I do is make effigies of them and destroy them. And uh, I think it's a really healthy thing to do with your hate. And that is destroy the uh, effigies of your enemy. And then hopefully the same thing will happen to them. Satanism is the integration of reason and instinct, blood and brains, mind and force. Well, Dr. LeVay is our high priest because he is certainly the most advanced person in the Church of Satan. He's truly a brilliant man and one that we can all learn from. Actually, he never ceases to amaze me with the, the wondrous things that he's experienced and has to teach. I read the Satanic Bible at age 13 and realized that I was a Satanist. When the Devil's Avenger finally came out, that was just a delightful revelation. Some people seem to have been freaked out by learning a little more about the Doctor's personality and about the fascinating bunch of individuals that he gathered around him. But I was overjoyed. I felt that here we found that he really lives the Satanic philosophy utterly and completely without any stinting. I first became interested in the Satanic philosophy when I was very young. Uh, probably 12 or 13, I started learning about Anton LaVey specifically and read the Satanic Bible and found it very much to my liking. It was really built on his life as working in the cage with the uh, lions and tigers and being, uh, being on the midway and playing for, you know, burlesque strippers and things. And it all sort of came together in this, this alchemical, magical thing called the Church of Satan and the Satanic philosophy. And somehow he was able to take the writings of Mom and, and Ben Hecht and Nietzsche and uh, Mark Twain put them all together in, a, in a, new, a new way that will lead us into the 21st century, in my opinion. The authorized biography was uh, the culmination of a lot of dreams and, I must say, a lot of magical workings. I am a satanic witch, and I'm very proud to be one. And now, our national anthem. Listen well. Drums beating like thunder. Straight from hell. Trumpets are blaring. The times come round. Satan is here to claim his ground. There's an earth that's green. There's an earth that's free. There's a place for you and a place for me. But the bleeding hearts wouldn't let it be. We don't need them anymore. Let the lions and tigers rip them up. The arena shouts for Christian blood. Let them chew them up. and spit them out. We don't need them anymore. Once, there was a need for simple minds. Once, there was a need to save men's souls. Fools had to be forced to 
stay in line. Preachers and Bibles that serve those goals with their holy writ and their cardinal sin. They could force their paper demons into a cardboard prison. A cursed cell. They can't do that anymore. Furies from hell are diving down. Lex talionis is their cry. Even though tricksters make the law, justice is served by fang and claw with their beaks of steel. See them slash a skin. Righteous Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, Jew, they've become a plague. So let's start anew. We don't need them anymore. Drums out of the darkness. Listen well. Drums beating like thunder, straight from hell. Reggae Satanus, the times come round. Satan is here to claim his ground. With our morning star from the deepest night. Smash the crumbling cross, for might is right. Let the shuffling zombies grope for life and will reign forevermore. So it is done. I have a piece by Ben Hecht here that it was an uncredited bit of writing. It was the prologue for Gone with the Wind. And I believe that uh, without it, without that necessary shot, that impact at the beginning of the film, that it perhaps would not have gotten the accolades or the acclaim that it did. There was a land of cavaliers and cotton fields called the Old South. Here in this patrician world, the age of chivalry took its last bow. Here was the last ever seen of the knights and their ladies fair, of master and of slave. Look for it only in books, for it is no more than a dream remembered, a civilization gone with the wind. <laughs> 